This week on the Animal Heartbeat, we are graced by the uh, the presence of Dr. Brian Scanson from Colorado State University. Welcome, Brian, to the Animal Heartbeat. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're super excited to talk to you about pulmonic stenosis. Um, and mostly we'll be focusing on dogs, I guess. But if you want to bring some cat stories or some equine pulmonic stenosis stories, you know, uh, feel free. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I look forward to it. It's uh, uh, certainly a pleasure to join you both. We all know that we see particular breeds affected by pulmonic stenosis. What, what are the most common breeds that you see in your clinic presenting with pulmonic stenosis? Uh, it's a good question. It's, it's It has actually evolved a bit over the years, I would say. The current answer to that question is unquestionably the French Bulldog. Uh, <laughs> probably uh, greater than 50% of the cases I currently see uh, are French Bulldogs. Wow, yeah. Some of that is probably a bit of a hospital bias because some of the interventions we perform. Um, but I think it's true that that trend of a bit of a change in prevalence has been something I've observed over the last several years. Um, going back 10 years ago, I saw quite a bit more English Bulldogs, Terriers, Chihuahuas, mixed breeds, um, but now the, the Frenchie dominates. Yeah, I think we we will feel the same way about the breed uh, switch over time in the UK and, and in Europe. I think there's, there's many more French Bulldogs that we see. And of course, those pose particular challenges um, for us. I think you know, getting a good echo window is hard enough. H- how do you uh, assess the severity of pulmonic stenosis in these dogs? What, not not just the Frenchies, but in any breed, um, what are your your top tips for working out? Do we need to worry about this pulmonic stenosis in this particular individual, or is it something that we can monitor um, or, or consider some medical treatment rather than intervention? I think it's a great question. I think the first thing I would say is that um, the answer to that is almost completely devoid of any evidence. So we have almost no scientific basis for this. So like all the best decisions we make. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> everything I say following this, you know, will be uh, will be uh, opinion and nothing more to a great degree. With that said, you know, I think. But I, I think that point is important because, you know, in mitral valve disease, we now have, you know, a good number of papers, even in some of the feline cardiomyopathies, we have some reasonable controlled studies. Right. Th- those really do not exist. At best, we have retrospective studies in, in pulmonary valve stenosis. And I, th- I think that point should be made first because we really don't have any evidence guiding what we do. So w- with that said, um, how do I assess a dog with pulmonary valve stenosis? I, I do think then... In the absence of evidence, I think we have to weigh several factors to decide what might be the right decision for an individual patient. That decision for me is certainly going to be dependent on the severity of the disease, and we can discuss Mm -hmm. ways to assess that. Classically, severity is considered the uh, peak transpulmonary pressure gradient, but as we all know, that is subject to some challenges, namely it's a flow dependent variable. Uh, RV function plays a role here that when RV dysfunction develops or when we have severe tricuspid insufficiency or when we have sedation on board, all of these things may impact that measured gradient. So it does start with the gradient. uh, For me, it starts with the presence of clinical signs. So the animal that is syncopal, cyanotic, uh, exercise intolerant, um, or in heart failure, those do weigh in to my decision making as as far as the urgency or necessity of an intervention. And I think the exercise intolerance is hard, isn't it? Because many of these dogs have had it since birth. So some owners, especially of these brachycephalic dogs or, you know, dogs with comorbidities, you know, we see more and more in the French spinal disease or joint disease. It's tough to know if they're exercise intolerant or not, isn't it? Have you got any any advice on that or have you got any wisdom to share? Uh, certainly no wisdom. I, I can tell you that I uh, I agree with everything that you just said. I think many of these dogs, particularly if we're talking about the Frenchie, do have substantial brachycephalic obstructive airway conditions that right. do limit their capacity. And, and we struggle with understanding, you know, if the dog seemingly is a bit exercise intolerant, which of these factors predominates. With that said, I I do find 
there are clients that seem to recognize that this puppy is not as active as other puppies that they've had, or you know, right. occasionally get the ones where they have multiple uh, animals from a similar litter and they recognize a difference. And so I think while it is difficult to determine the presence or severity of exercise intolerance at the same time, we probably miss the existence of that finding as well, because both clients are insensitive and perhaps we are, are insensitive in ways to measure it. When you mentioned echo, uh, Brian, and beyond the pressure gradient, as you said, how thorough will, how many measurements pretty much, how thorough is your assessment in terms of severity? Which other less flow dependent, let's say, methods do you use beyond, beyond pressure gradients? Well, I mean, because of the interest of our group, we do tend to measure VTI ratios and, and valve areas. Mm -hmm. um, but to give you an honest answer to that question, I mean, do I use those much in the clinical decision making? The answer to that is, is no. So for me, it's presence of clinical signs, the severity of the pressure gradient, and then the secondary remodeling that occurs. And so for me, what is the degree of RV wall thickening? What is the degree of right atrial enlargement? Is there concurrent defects, right to left shunting, tricuspid valve insufficiency? I would say those factor in much more in my decision for or against an intervention than an indexed valve area or something like that. That's good to know. And then regarding valve morphology, if you start looking at valve morphology, can you tell us? How do you prefer to classify different types of valve morphology, different types of pulmonary stenosis, and how much that might impact on your on your decision to go ahead and dilate this case? That is a substantial interest of mine, and I do pay quite a bit of attention to the valve morphology, somewhat in the decision of intervention. But again, for me, it's the clinical science pressure gradient and remodeling that determine whether I need to intervene. The valve morphology really tells me how I should intervene or how I believe I should intervene in a given patient. And so when you start talking about the different morphologies of this disease, uh, there's many different ways that it's been characterized, as, as you both know. You know, when we look to the human, there's the typical form or sometimes called the doming form. Mm -hmm. which seems to predominate in the human. And then there is the dysplastic form. Those terms, uh, to be honest, are not very useful, in my opinion, because typical only means something if that's the dominant form. If and that's I, the typical form, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and that's, <clears throat> I don't believe what a human physician would call typical is, is typical in a dog. Um, I'd say much more what they consider dysplastic is going to be within the spectrum that we see on a daily basis. But even that definition is a bit lacking because on the human side, typically it just refers to thickened and or immobile leaflets uh, rather than fused commissural uh, fusion and doming. And so um, then you look to, you know, what Claudio Busidori and, and others have used a type A and a type B. And I think um, I think that is a useful system. However, my personal opinion on that is as I've looked at different papers and or just watched um, or had referrals from other cardiologists, what one group might call type A, I don't think is always the same as what another group might call type A. If it's solely dictated by the pulmonary valve annulus, as let's say less than 80% of the aortic valve annulus as a measure of hypoplasia, I think that's one definition that you'll find out there. To me, pulmonary valve annulus itself isn't enough to decide what the right intervention or likelihood of success of an intervention will be, although it, it definitely factors in. Others look at, you know, whether the there's post dilation, whether there's thickening of the leaflets or not. Almost invariably, there's, you know, we don't really measure the valve thickness, but subjectively, almost invariably, there's a degree of thickening, even in what would be considered a fused doming valve. So, to answer your question, uh, I try and take a more granular approach. And so I do separate out and we're kind of working on a scoring system at the moment, but I look at what is the valve thickness and uh, again, hard to quantify, but I try and look at the echo appearance of the aortic valve, compare the pulmonary valve and decide if there's right. thickening and we can add some subjectivity to that, whether it's mild, moderate or severe. 
I tend to look at the pulmonary valve annulus relative to the aortic annulus for two reasons. One, is it hypoplastic? But also, I think measuring the aortic valve annulus from a parasternal long axis perspective kind of also gives me probably an upper limit of what I might consider the normal pulmonary annulus should be, even if it is not. So I'm unlikely to exceed a balloon to annulus ratio greater than 1.5 times the aortic annulus. And I might adjust that certainly if the pulmonary annulus is profoundly hypoplastic. But many times the spatial resolution of the aortic annulus is cleaner and easier to measure. And so I do look at the aortic annulus to kind of give me a guide of what might my, my maximal balloon dimension need uh, be. Uh, and then I look at the degree of fusion. So do the valves dome and systole? Are they fused at their tips? Or many times what we see is there really isn't obvious commissural fusion of these valves. They're just immobile. They're so thick that they don't really come apart. Um, it almost creates a tunnel-like what others right. I think have termed an hourglass appearance. I think that gets us a little closer to talking the same language, although I still think the hourglass analogy has some flaws as well, because sometimes the hourglass is related to fusion and doming with a degree of adhesion at the sinotubular junction, and sometimes the hourglass is caused by a large chunk of fibrotic tissue that exists in the sinus or at the sinotubular junction. So that's also a bit of an angiographic descriptor to me rather than an echocardiographic descriptor, so seldom known in advance quite to the same extent. And then I do look uh, quite closely at the sinotubular junction. And this is something that I think is more difficult by echo uh, than it is certainly by CT or TE or um, angiography. Because I think many papers, in, in my opinion, have classified fibrotic tissue at the sinotubular junction as a supravalvular stenosis. My opinion is that is not supravalvular stenosis. That is... Yeah within the complex of the valve. Yeah, I'm, gu I'm guilty of that myself. And I uh, I remember you speaking yeah. about it and I thought, oh, I better read about that and, and, and check. And I, so I, I don't use the term supravalvular now in the same way. Uh, you know, I, I talk more anatomically and specifically about a fibrous lesion at the sinotubular junction because that's what it is. And then the terminology, we don't get bogged down in what's valve and what's not. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I mean, I think... Um, I've spent a considerable amount of time trying to sort this out, you know, from <laughs> human anatomy and and kind of looking at a lot of dogs. Um, I wouldn't say that there's consensus anywhere, but it does seem to be in the human that the valve exists from the right ventricular myocardium, where it terminates at the annulus, to the origin of the pulmonary trunk, which is at the sinotubular junction. And therefore, yeah. the sinotubular junction belongs to the valve and therefore disease of that area is all within the spectrum of valvar stenosis, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're we're not looking at an arterial disease. We're looking at a valvular disease. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. It's um I think it's important we we try and talk the same language. And and I wonder if it's it's something that you know we need to think about uh, a consensus statement for because it's an area that with the evolution of ballooning uh, into different procedures or augmented procedures high pressure balloons cutting balloons stents over the past decade or more i think um it's important we try and get on the same page and treat the same patients in a similar way and at the moment i think people are doing things differently aren't they and and you you talk to some people and they still talk about type b pulmonic stenosis and and i don't really know what that means I, that doesn't give me enough information and i think you know claudio's paper uh, and the statement there they're sort of a a b types that, that that he described was great at the time but i think now we've seen different breeds we see more frenchies we see more disease of the next levels in that valvular region the sinus tubular junction and, and um i think that's just complicated the issue the only comment i was going to make in addition to that is is the ecosystems have improved since those original papers our right. visualization of this area is better and then what has really changed for me is the use of cardiac CT. I mean, I think um, when you start doing cardiac CT on these patients, you see the full spectrum of the outflow tract and the, and the pulmonary trunk, and you're not limited by uh, two-dimensional acoustic windows that in these breeds particularly can be challenging. Yeah, very challenging, yeah. yeah. So that's super interesting. Reconstruction 
changes how you visualize this valve, in my opinion. On, on Echo, what I feel sometimes is, except that on the, the two sides of the spectrum, it's always very difficult for us to predict how the valve will respond to ballooning. And we'll be discussing a lot about different types of ballooning and so on shortly. But do you think CT will help you with that? Because sometimes you see very ugly valves, these plastic valves that still respond really well to high pressure balloon and other valves that we thought maybe there is some degree of fusion that will respond and doesn't respond. Do you think CT helps you kind of predict which valves may respond better to standard ballooning or high pressure ballooning? I think it's a great question. Um, I guess my answer to that would be CT clearly helps me understand better the morphology of the valve that I'm looking at. Now, the next step to that is, does that understanding improve my ability to prognosticate who is going to respond to balloon? I don't know that I can answer that in all fairness. I, I will say there's a degree of selection bias in that when I look at a very thickened valve with substantial fibrotic tissue at the STJ or in the sinus itself, fairly or unfairly, I advise the client that, that balloon dilation is unlikely to be of substantial benefit here. And that's that may be true. It may not. I, I don't have solid data to support that other than, you know, 20 years of experience ballooning these dogs. And, and, and so we have this conundrum now where I think I see things much better by CT that dictates my decision making. And then I confirm that bias by those patients receiving a stent. And so I think it's a great question. It'd be nice to look at that more scientifically and try and um, make that determination. But what I would say is CT, particularly in bulldog breeds, allows visualization of the valve that is simply not possible by echo. It's cool that, the, of course, your experience that you have been doing this for 20 years, because the, the, my point was exactly what you are saying. I think very quickly now we'll jump into C, into a stent, the a transpulmonary stent, um, because we can, but then is it better? Uh, because we will not know if the valve would have, have responded to, to balloon dilation. Of course, then we, we, we have an implant versus no implant. But having said that, of course, is the risk of failing a ballooning and then a second intervention and the cost of like a second intervention versus hopefully with a stent uh, to, to solve the, the problem. Um, but do you feel then, because that you have been doing this for 20 years, when you didn't have stent available and those ugly valves that looked fibrotic and so on, how, how many of them would respond or any tips if, if a stent is not possible that you would feel, okay, this valve may still respond or that's just in COVID unpredictable? I don't think it's completely unpredictable. I do think it's challenging. So I would say the a little bit of the the journey for me is, you know, in my residency and and shortly thereafter, exclusively we used, you know, tie shack balloons, what would be considered low pressure balloons. And my anecdotal experiences, those worked perfectly well for valves that were relatively thin with a normal size annulus that domed in systole. Um, and probably had mild or minimal fibrotic adhesions at the STJ. I think somewhat interestingly, either I've gotten better at recognizing more of the spectrum, or as we alluded to earlier, the spectrum of disease has changed as the French bulldog becomes the dominant lesion. We certainly ballooned some English bulldogs early on, you know, in at least my experience, where we used Tyshack and other type of low pressure balloons and didn't feel like we made a heck of a benefit in those patients. I think most uh, cardiologists feel the same way about, you know, yeah. th these patients historically. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, as, as things kind of moved towards the high pressure balloons, and that was probably, I don't know, I would say in the 2010s um, um, in that kind of range, I feel like we saw benefits in some patients that we didn't see uh, with the lower pressure balloons. So I think there was an additive benefit to using high pressure right. again. You know, that's an opinion, not really based on science, but uh, anecdotally, I'd say that's true. But then what I would say about the French bulldog is when I would balloon Frenchies with high pressure balloons, uh, it's exactly as you say, sometimes the result is a little better than I expected. Sometimes I thought we'd have a decent result and, and really we did not. But what was almost invariably true in my experience is the result would not be durable. And so I might balloon a Frenchie, then a year later, 
almost without question, his gradient had increased, not always to the same severity, but still mm -hmm. usually to a severe, uh, you know, if you want to use echo as the gold standard of severity, to a severe level of obstruction, you know, greater than 80, greater than 100, what have you. So my, the rationale for now, kind of when I see a Frenchie with an ugly valve, I advise the client to move to stenting fairly quickly. And and usually it's because in the past, either I had no benefit with low pressure, moderate, but not a durable benefit with high pressure. And the hope is that stenting might provide both a better result and a more durable result. And it's important to make the right choice there, isn't it? Because for many of these owners, you've got one shot, yeah, but one exactly. financial support effectively, either through pet insurance uh, or, or just through their own funding or crowdfunding more and more, actually. Yeah. Um, you've got one attempt. And if that doesn't go well, it's a real shame. Um, and everyone feels a bit sad about that. In terms of the decision making, I think I think we've all changed how we, we approach those cases. I very much ag agree with that. What I would say is the first few stents that I put in, I would always caution the client, standard of care is, is a balloon. We should do a balloon. Right. And then we might have to come back. And it's exactly as you said, I the level of guilt that I experienced when that result wasn't good was you know troubling so then i moved to okay we're going to balloon your dog and immediately in the cath lab if i don't like the result i will move to a stent the one comment i would have about that is at least in theory if you dilate that valve you potentially alter the landing zone of your stent and maybe there's a theoretical risk or greater risk of stent dislodgement if you have recently dilated immediately right. previous. So with that, I've moved away from, from that offering as well. So now my conversation to the client is either, I think this is a balloonable valve, in which case, if we can avoid an implant, that's what we should do, or this is not a balloonable valve, and then your option is stent. And I basically leave it as those two options. Yeah, and I think stenting is not intervention 101 and, and there are many cardiologists who will be fairly happy to to do a balloon but maybe not place a stent um and, and i'd be supportive of that because <clears throat> it's an implant if it if it goes it goes if it if there's a problem halfway through deployment you've got to troubleshoot that and um i, I think it's it, it can be super challenging i was going to say just briefly let's take it a step back and think about our criteria for judging success we talked about likelihood of a good outcome for these patients who are undergoing a balloon valvuloplasty, and if you think it's likely to be good or, or not, what, what is a good outcome? Um, how do you define a, a good outcome from a balloon? Well, good outcome from a balloon is the dog lives a normal life and doesn't die of their pulmonary stenosis. Unfortunately, right. <laughs> we don't have that data. Um, the crystal the data. ball is not uh, calibrated. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think <clears throat> this is where you have to take some extrapolation from the literature. There's as you know, there are some papers, you know, that at least have looked at dogs that did not have a balloon as compared to those that had a balloon. Sure. And those would suggest that a pressure gradient of around 60 in one paper, maybe 80 in another paper, suggest that that dog, at least the risk of a cardiac related mortality, if their pressure gradient is below 60, let's say, is lessened and, and probably, you know, maybe not identical to this to the normal population, but not too far off. Whereas the 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 more the pressure gradient increases above that threshold, the greater the risk of a cardiac related mortality. And so, for me, that's kind of a threshold that I would like to see. Now, certainly, the lower the better. I'd love to get it to normal. I mean, a physician would be happy less than thirty. That's probably unrealistic, or at least it has been in my experience. Mm. But if I get it to under sixty. I consider that to probably have a benefit for that animal's lifespan. But then you you do run into this question of what is the durability of the result? Because I think oftentimes we look at the 24-hour post-cath echo and we say, great, have a good life. And certainly those animals continue to be followed up, although in my practice, a lot of times they go back to another cardiologist to be followed. Um who maybe doesn't measure, you know, envelopes exactly the same way, or maybe right. the dog's, um, you know, stress level or hemodynamic status changes at a subsequent appointment. But I do think the short-term effect of the balloon is one measure, but probably it can't be the sole measure because we do see 
certainly in balloons, even in stents, an increase in pressure over time. And knowing what to do in those patients, I think, is challenging. Have you got a feel for the rate of restenosis for, uh, let's say, a um, classic valve leaflet fusion? Do you think it, it's it's around the 5% that I think is out there in the literature, or, or, or do you think differently? And is it different for the Frenchies and these other more complex morphologies? The, I'll answer the second first. I do think it's different for the more complex morphologies. Mm. I think if you tear a fused doming valve, those dogs tend to do rather well. I wish I saw more of those. We just we just don't. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it's 5%. Actually, to my clients, I tend to quote 15%. And that's somewhat personal right. experience, somewhat my reading of the literature, um, that there is you know a 15% chance that this will recur. But I think that the definition of that is fraught with challenges as well. So what is a recurrence? What is a uh, you know suboptimal result? I think that's difficult. I, I do believe that the, the patient with pulmonary stenosis tends to reflect some of the lowest pressures on the 24-hour post-cath echo. And then almost invariably at one month, at three months, at six months, there's some fluctuation. Sometimes it's pretty close, but it's seldom lower. And that's slightly at odds, at least with what I was taught a long time ago, is that you know you you create edema in the valve and you balloon it. It might be thicker originally, and you might actually not see the true result for another month or two with the somewhat implied thought that if it's edematous after a, a ballooning acutely, that it might get better as that edema resolves. I don't see that personally. I see you know, it do anything worse than over time. You know, it's so interesting you say that because I, I was taught the same thing. Oh yeah, they get edema and inflammation. It's tissue, it's biological tissue. You damage it, it gets swollen. And I've taught people that in the past, but I don't think I believe it anymore. I, it's really I, I interesting don't. you say that because yeah. I, I've started echoing them uh, following day, uh, following morning before they're discharged. And, and then we see them at one month um, routinely. Um, it, it, it's always higher at one month. Not much, but it's never low. Yep. Uh, yep. And that's, that's just very interesting to me. The, rest, the restenosis uh, right is really interesting because I, I always thought it was quite low. And now, yeah, the recent data from you, uh, Brian, and others, and and from Winter at all that show right up to thirty eight percent, twenty to thirty eight percent. I was like, wow, that that's huge. And then, of course, it depends on how you define the criteria and so on. And uh, but then that was like, no, this this can't be true, or we we don't see that. Um, and now we just recently looked at our own data in two or three centers here, and we have exactly the same. Being very careful with the criteria, just looking at. Uh, the follow-ups, the long-term follow-ups, two, three months after, in, indeed, it increased, and we have very similar similar pre uh, pre uh, prevalences, um, which is yeah, which is interesting. It's, it's the classic example. If you don't look at it, uh, mm -hmm. you, you you don't you don't see it. You don't find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But what I think then is really challenging. You just told us how would you decide when to intervene, but then how do you do you decide when to re-intervene to to go in again? So even if okay, the the, the pressure is increasing. But where do you draw the line? Well, what do you use to decide, okay, I will now put a second stand or I will now stand these guys or what are your criteria? Well, I think it depends on what the first intervention was. So my criteria do change a bit if it were a balloon and that has now had an increase in pressure and as compared to whether it was a stent that has now had an increase in pressure. Some of the same criteria that we mentioned before are relevant. I do think, you know, the, the pressure gradient matters, but again, how is the RV handling things? You know, is there right ventricular wall thickening, right atrial enlargement, or right ventricular systolic dysfunction? All of those things weigh into it. I'd say a, a common scenario is, um, let's just make it a, a hypothetical case. A dog comes in with a pressure gradient of 130, and he receives a balloon or a stent. And, you know, we get that down to 50 on the, the one day post. And then maybe he doesn't get followed up for a few months, but at three months, he gets an echo somewhere. Um, and, you know, it's, it's 80. And the question is, do we do anything there? Well, then the next questions to me are, does he have any clinical signs and how is his right heart handling all of this? And if you have the ability, if you're the one following these serially and you can actually pull up the first echo, pull up the recent echo, I do think it's sometimes very informative to just get a subjective assessment of has the right heart 
you know, is there more septal flattening? Is the left heart uh, underfilled? Those types of things are clues to me that suggest to me that this is still hemodynamically of importance for this patient, certainly the presence of clinical signs if they're present. If you don't have that luxury, then, you know, an AD is not necessarily something I'm going to jump to intervene, but that's where what was done before. If it was a ballooning case and I see a clear fibrotic lesion at the STJ, that's probably a case I might suggest to the client, we could probably do better with a stent. If, however, it was a stent previously, then, you know, my likelihood to re-intervene is not high unless I see an obvious target. And I do think the evaluation of the post-stent patient is a bit different because my experience with the stented dog is that when there is obstruction, it is no longer at the STJ and in the valve apparatus itself because I've addressed that. And that is, I think, the benefit of the stent is that it can physically hold things open at that area, which the balloon may not be effective in relieving. What the stent is unable to do, though, is deal with the immediate subvalve region and particularly the RVOT. And particularly early on in our experience, you know, when we would just center the stent on the valve annulus, you would have half of the stent in the right heart, uh, right ventricle. Right. And in that case, I think you almost open yourself up to a risk of compression and fracture and, and complications. So if that patient now has 80, 100, 120, uh, gradient post stenting, and it's all the RV, uh, why is putting more metal in there going to be beneficial? To me, unfortunately, that's either now a surgical case or, uh, you know, aggressive beta blockade in the hopes that we can have some benefit. We, we found the same in our population of stents over time. I think I've done about 50 or so, I guess, between here and another center. And um, we found that some of them um, have either had you know, crimping, crushing of the stent because it's too low. And those were the earlier cases. I, I think over time, if you look at my my post-deployment uh, angiograms, they're getting higher and higher as I've got more confident to leave more out in the main PA and land it better in relationship to that RVOT. But I think the dynamics in the RVOT, RVOT change over time because obviously you've got free pulmonic insufficiency. You can then get right ventricular dilation. You can get functional abnormalities, which of course might change how severe that is, um, but but it's fascinating to to see these cases over time and kind of learn along with how they're developing. Because I think I'm, I think well, I think we're all very much on that learning curve. Um, I, I I really like that you talk about how that you assess RV remodeling and LV remodeling. I think that that yeah I, yeah that's that's really great because um, of course it makes a lot of sense in this in, instead of just looking at one value. In that regard, how much? Pulmonary regurgitation on on stent guys will have an effect on your RV remodeling. And did you ever have problems? Are you ever worried with severe PR? Because then, yeah, theoretically, then we have a pressure overload heart that then on top we have a, a volume overload challenge. So we have increased preload and afterload. Is, is that ever a problem? Do you do you, do you see guys where PR might then be a problem? I believe it it can be, although I think the issue of pulmonary insufficiency in a stent is perhaps a bit overstated or it's more of a concern than it needs to be, is my personal opinion. And there's a few reasons for that. Number one, the right ventricle from an evolutionary perspective is a, a volume uh, responsive chamber, right? So with changes in preload associated with breathing, with, you know, fluid shifts, things of that nature, exercise, the right heart handles that very well. What it doesn't handle well is pressure, which is what the left ventricle is evolutionarily developed to, to deal with. And so I do think if you were going to look at which of these loads is the greater concern in the right heart, pressure overload is worse than volume overload. And you can just anecdotally look at the dogs with tricuspid dysplasia. Certainly, they don't tolerate it for a lifespan, but they have wide open tricuspid valves and will live to three, four years of age, really, until they go into AFib before they really show severe signs. And so I do think for the right heart, pressure is the, the greater enemy than, than volume. That's number one. Number two, the capacitance of the pulmonary vascular bed is such that with each right heart ejection, that blood carries by momentum of that column all the way out into the pulmonary vascular bed. It's a low resistance system, almost exclusively low resistance in dogs with PS, although 
I have wondered for some time now that we see all these breaks, phallic dogs, chronic hypoxemia, particularly where I live at altitude, whether pulmonary vascular remodeling could be more of a problem. But I, uh, to your question, I haven't really at least been able to tease that out or see it more clearly. But in general, the pulmonary vascular bed can receive that volume. And at least uh, Charles Mullins in his books talks about the fact that 85% of that blood basically just by momentum continues to move out into pulmonary circulation. Um, and so there's a small volume that even would be able to regurgitate. And then when it does, it comes back at a low pressure, given the low pressure of the and the low resistance of the pulmonary vascular system. Um, and then you add to that fact that you have almost invariably a fairly stiff right ventricle. And again, when I'm stenting a patient, I do worry probably the most about the risk of compressive forces on that stent. So in fact, for me, giving a little more volume to the right heart to open up the outflow tract paradoxically may not be a bad thing as far Maybe it's as protective. exactly yeah. limiting some of the compression that will happen on that stent. So uh, those are all the reasons. And then last thing I would say, even in the human, if we use the human model as an example, in the tetralogy patients that have a non-valved conduit after repair that have a uh, resection of the pulmonary valve tissue and wide open PI, you know, those, those patients, so long as the afterload is relieved, the obstruction is relieved, those patients live to their third or fourth decade of life before they have problems. Well, if dogs live to 30 or 40, then maybe I would worry about PI. That's, that's a case report in itself. But I don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those are all the reasons why I'm less concerned about pulmonary insufficiency. But to your question, have I seen it be a problem? I think the answer is yes. And I think the case where I worry about stenting in particular is the dog that has concurrent tricuspid valve dysplasia. I think right. if both valves are severely incompetent, that is going to be more problematic. Um, and classically, those are the dogs that present to you in right-sided congestive heart failure with severe pulmonary stenosis, severe tricuspid insufficiency. And the debate is if I think it's a stenting valve, meaning I don't think balloon is gonna open it, we have stented several of those. I wouldn't say you know that we have seen miraculous benefits in that population. And I think it's because if you can't concurrently address the tricuspid insufficiency, then the increased volume load of PI means that the right-sided failure continues to be a problem. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you, you mentioned beta blockers, and this is going to be a good question. Um, I feel like the specter of beta blockers has been hanging over this conversation, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it was and on I, my mind yeah, to mention it. And, well, and yeah. I just hope you guys have different opinions, considering your recent data from Bristol, uh, Kieran. When do you give beta blockers, uh, Brian? Um, Pre-ballooning, in which cases do you start beta blockers? what doses and what I would be also very interested on is do you ever remove beta blockers do you ever take them down so if when you have a successful outcome uh, or what criteria do you use to taper them down and take out the, the beta blockers I think it's a it's a great question um well to, I'll answer your question what do I do I, I put everyone on a beta blocker so um that's the short answer to your question I'm less concerned about the ballooning dogs, to be honest. Um, I am not of the opinion that a beta blocker, you know, is going to dramatically prevent complications during the procedure. Um, I think the the data from Bristol showed that. I think anecdotally, you know, that's been in others' experience as well. And that's because the suicidal right ventricle, you know, is actually an exceedingly rare phenomenon in veterinary medicine. Much more you know, common if we with saw that more commonly, though, I think. maybe you could make more of an argument for preoperative beta blockade to limit that. Do you think you've um, seen that more with the stent population than the balloons? It maybe depends a little bit on your definition. I will say right. we have certainly seen greater instability under anesthesia. Um, and some of it, I think, reflects the fact that we're we're treating a more severely affected population, particularly sure. these French with horrendous outflow tracks, because historically, a lot of those we wouldn't even take to balloon. We would just say there's no option here. And now that we take yeah. them stenting, you know, they're 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 more problematic under anesthesia. We, we push them harder, right? Yeah, exactly. And then you put a long sheath, you know, large sheath in there and you cross the valve, which, you know, maybe is obstructive, you know, to a good portion of it. So 
I guess I would say, do I see dogs under anesthesia develop substantial hypotension and or profound hypoxemia if they have a, a patent foramen? Uh, yeah, I, we see that more than we did previously. I think it's somewhat reflective of the population. And then the intervention is a little more you know, involved and, and there's more obstructive stuff in the heart at the time of cath. To me, that's not really the, the suicidal RV. That's the suicidal RV is everything is fine until you relieve the afterload and then everything goes to pot. And, and that I don't think is common. Uh, we've seen it for sure. Um, but I think it's far and away the exception rather than the rule. Um, so getting back to the question of beta blockers, I don't, you know, if I, if I could absolutely predict who was going to have that, you know, maybe I would be more selective. The reason I use beta blockers is again, it gets back to this question of I, I'm trying to limit the compressive forces on a stent because now most often I'm I'm stenting these patients. And you know, obviously Kieran's paper didn't look at stenting uh really, it was ballooning patients. And so I do think that's a different population and a different rationale for the use of beta blockade. And then to your last question, do I ever take it off? The answer is yes. Um if I get a very uh, good result. And then over time, we see reverse remodeling of the right heart. You know, if the wall thickness is normal or close to normal, I don't see any rationale for a beta block at that point. And that's probably also a minority of patients where, you know, we are happy enough with the right heart over time. And those are almost always, again, the thin doming valve that open nicely with the balloon that eventually, yes, we taper off their beta blockade. A question for both of you. Do you have medium-term, long-term data on dogs with anomalous pre-pulmonary coronary arteries that you have stent. How do those behave? Brian, you go for it. You're, you're the guest. Sure. sure. Um, I think in our data set, we are at eight now with a, with a pre-pulmonary course. Uh, I think two of those were single left and the rest were single right. My experience with those is they are they tolerate a stent um, just fine. So all eight of those received a stent without overt complications. We have followed, I think the longest is probably in the three years-ish out and still doing well. Um, trying to, th I don't think any of them that I can recall off the top of my head have had, um, you know, clinical complications or or clinical decompensation, but you know, it's probably a little early to say. So in a medium turn, one to three years, I my experience has been you can stent the prepulmonary coronary artery um, in both the English and the French um, bulldog. I think those are all the breeds were either English or French. Uh, no, one Shih Tzu, actually. So yeah, I, I think it's doable. I think, you know, I, I don't post dilate those, obviously. You know, I've really stick to one to one. Um, I also think the CT is helpful there. So I know what one-to-one -one really is rather than kind of guessing off an echo measurement. Um, and then obviously right. to make a diagnosis, CT is helpful as well. But Kieran, what's your experience? Uh, just just to mention them, um, you know, I remember looking at some of your CT images in the past and, and um, you can really define the distance between the coronary and the pulmonary annulus. And some of them are really tight and some of them are not so tight. So you know you've got a little bit more sort of the forgiving case that was super interesting i think to me and, and uh you know I, I think cardiac ct is is a whole a whole other thing in our toolbox we can use to, to try and assess these patients the difficulty with it is cost implications and, and also my anesthetists always get a bit unhappy if i say well we're going to ct first and then we're going to go to theater and and actually probably the way that i i'm going to do it is actually have them ct the day before and, and move to the theater and i think that's why the way that some other centers do that as well um i don't ct them as standard at the moment but but I think it would be very useful to do that. In terms of number of cases, I can't tell you an exact number that I've done the, the stent on a pre-pulmonic coronary. They, they've all, as far as I know, been R2A. I, I want to say around 10 or, or, or 11 cases. I, I don't know. I seem to receive a, a, a lot of them after we published our paper, um, where a couple of cases were, were pre-pulmonic coronaries. I've got outcome on some of them. Wow, when was the first one that I did? The first one I, I did was 2018. Um, so I guess we've got five year, I think five year outcome on that dog now. And actually he's he's alone, doing great. I think there's two different types of um case that we see with these pulmonic stenosis and a pre-pulmonic coronary. I think we've got the ones where they've got a very sort of hypoplastic 
main pulmonary artery plus or minus long leaflet tissue plus or minus supravalvular. Huh, I'm so sorry. Sinotubular <laughs> ridges. I have to say, I don't say it anymore. Listen to me. Uh, it's like such a, a slip. Um, so yeah, the, these sinotubular ridges. And I think they're quite easy because the walls of the artery are basically parallel. And you've got a lot of tissue in there that will hold your stent in. And you go and put in your 10 millimeter stent in a nine or 10 millimeter uh, artery. And you can be pretty happy. You don't need to worry about post dilating or, or, or particularly positioning it. And then I think you've got ones in the English Bulldog, mainly are the ones that I've seen. And I can remember the dogs very well because they're, they're kind of nightmarish. I've had some, some really challenging cases where the annulus is very, very small you know, eight or nine millimeters. And then it flares into this huge, broad main pulmonary artery of, of 12 or 14 or 16 millimeters. And they're really, really hard, those cases. I, um, those are ones where really you, 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 I think, should coronary stress test. Um, so look at the effect of inflating smaller balloons and upsize your balloon and see what happens to your ST segment, your heart rate, your, your output. Um, we do look at visual change. We'll we'll cut down on the femoral and do a, um, a, an aortic root injection or, or a coronary injection for those cases to look at the the rate of flow more than a pacification through that that um, coronary artery. Because if the rate of flow slows down when you've got a ten millimeter balloon inflated, you probably shouldn't be using a ten millimeter stent um, because you're compressed. You're compressing the coronary. They're tough. Because I worry then that you effectively have a stent held in a ridge of a tissue that's quite narrow, that's wobbling around in this large RVOT and large PA. And I worry about that being very unstable. So I've taken to sort of flaring those stents like a like an hourglass to follow the hourglass. But it's really hard because the step up from the annulus to the, the wall of the artery can be sudden a sudden four millimeter step up and you can't get a stent to do that very reliably. You can sort of smooth it. And that makes me feel like it's a bit more secure. If it's an hourglass, it's not stretching the coronary, but it's it's being held in place because you're trying to conform to the walls of the artery. And I would hope that promotes endothelialization, although I don't know. They're really hard. So, so they end up as cases where you, you stress test the coronary, you deploy the stent and you sweat it as you deploy and you worry in case you've got it wrong. And then your stent's kind of hanging with a wire through it. And then you play with different size balloons and, and manipulate those balloons in order to try and get an appropriate flaring. Uh, uh, the cases I've done have all gone great. I remember one, I went, I went to, to another center who'd uh, a very experienced interventional center and they said, Oh, we have a really difficult case. Do you want to come and help? And I said, Oh yeah, sure. I've done these cases. I can come and help. And we lost two stents out in the MPA. We had to push them out into branches and balloon them up into the branches to secure them. We used a third stent. We got it in, but only just, it was a hard day. Dog's doing doing fine, but it was a tough procedure. And of course, that was the one I was like demonstrating my skills at another centre. So uh, <laughs> you know, it's not all of those ones go wrong. And um, but they're they're tough, I think. D do you identify those differences, Brian, as well, or am I just making this up? Is this something that I've seen and uh, and imagined? No, I agree with that. I I think, and it is the English that is more problematic. Yeah. Usually, the Frenchy. Uh, it's not much different than a typical pulmonary valve stent, to no. be honest. No. Um, the, a couple quick comments. Number one, the other thing I think, so I have a grad student looking at the coronaries in, in all these docs. We have about 75 CTs of PS that had that have had stents. Um, right. And so what I, I think we also need to be aware of in the human, it's not solely the prepulmonary course that is problematic for stenting. Um, normal coronary ostia can be associated with compression. And by some of the, you know, the melody and the harmony valve data, um, if the coronary is within two millimeters of the annulus of the pulmonary valve, you know, and usually it's the left main in that population, then, or, or the, the periconal, then that can be, that can be problematic. Well, I will tell you that almost every French bulldog, the left main is within two millimeters of the the, of the pulmonary annulus. And so I think we don't know what we're doing, even in dogs that have normal coronary anatomy. And so we're right. starting at that, although I have thankfully knock on wood, I have not recognized, you know, massive coronary occlusions. 
And then to the question of the pre-pulmonary course, I agree with you, it's the English bulldog. I'm not personally convinced how much we have to flare. I think there's often so much dysplastic tissue there mm -hmm. that I think that that stent is going to hold. The concern for me is in the English bulldog at 10 millimeters, uh, that's seldom the size of the annulus I would like the English bulldog to have. And so right. um, I just don't know how much we're doing. I think we're doing something, but how are we helping them enough to justify the cost and the risk of the procedure? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I, I've got a final <clears throat> couple of questions before we wrap up, actually. The first one is, do you think there's a place for cutting balloons in pulmonic stenosis intervention? And the second question is, where does surgery fit in now? D do we need the surgeons anymore for this? Or are we moving, you know, to just this being an interventional procedure? So great questions. The, to the first question, the answer is is almost exclusively no. I don't think cutting balloon has a place in this disease with the presence of stenting. The exception to that, and what we haven't talked about, but it gets to the earlier question about nomenclature, which I I think is, you know, maybe I'm more obsessed with than I should be, but I do think it's important that we talk the same language. It's super when you talk about infundibular stenosis, when you talk about double chambered right ventricle. I do think, and I still use cutting balloons in those because I cannot stent within the lumen of the right ventricle. Right. And if that is a fibrotic lesion, I have seen better benefit with cutting first and then high pressure dilation. So, um, but that is not valvar pulmonary stenosis. In the valvar pulmonary stenosis, uh, no, I don't, I can't remember the last cutting balloon I did. It's probably in the series that we published uh, before stenting. Sure. Um, I, I do think surgery, plays a role because I, I think there are cases that I am unable to effectively treat. And, and the classic example would be more when the lesion is immediately subvalve or the RV is so completely uh, thickened that there's complete cavity obliteration and there's almost no way that I can land a stent without engaging some of the distal RV. Those cases I, I do still currently stent many of them, but I usually caution the client based on where I know the stent is going to end up. Either I'm going to be completely in the pulmonary trunk and you're still going to be obstructive, or I'm going to be in the RV to some small extent, and likely we're going to be dealing with compression and all those complications. So I do think surgical uh, resection can play a role there. I think the unfortunate thing is, as this has become an interventional procedure, we have fewer and fewer surgeons who are comfortable with an approach to the RV outflow tract um, in veterinary medicine. And I think what it becomes then, unfortunately, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the risk and cost of surgery you know, greatly exceeds the risk and cost of an intervention, even an intervention that we kind of suspect will not be terribly beneficial or successful, many clients will still select the intervention and therefore we have even less cases that end up going to surgery to give them, you know, the caseload that they need to grow their skill set. But I, I do think there are cases that are surgical. Unfortunately, they seldom get surgery. Well, right. Maybe maybe one last question, uh, uh, Brian, something, so a nasty, but quite interesting complication, I think. So pulmonary edemas, pause ballooning. Have, have you seen them? What do you think the mechanism might be, or or more more interesting to us maybe? When are you worried about them? In which case you might be worried that these dogs might develop pulmonary edemas? For me, it's the tetralogies. So to me, I think if you have severely uh, underfilled lungs, so severe pulmonary hypocirculation, um, that patient, if you restore even close to a normal degree of pulmonary blood flow. Um, I have seen those dogs have complications. You know, the, I think the other case reports that are out there of a, you know, a very nice balloon all of a sudden decompensating into a severe pulmonary edema, I, I think that happens, but that's probably even less common than a suicidal right ventricle. And I, I think, you know, you might predict a perfectly nice thin valve with a gradient of over 200. That might be a dog that's at risk for that. But even those, oftentimes, they just do fine. There's no problems. And so I don't know that I have great ways to predict who might develop pulmonary edema because I think it's exceedingly rare. But it would be the case that you take from 200 plus to 20, um, in my experience. The greater issue, I think, is when you have a VSD 
um, uh, NPS or when you have tetralogy, when I have tried to stent those outflow tracks, it is exceedingly difficult to know how much you can open it without flooding the lungs, both because of the VSD flow may now switch to more of a left to right uh, dynamic, but equally those lungs have never seen a reasonable volume. And those lungs, I think, do not tolerate a return to normal blood flow. Thanks very much. Interesting stuff. Brilliant. So I think we are uh, reaching the end of our podcast. Brian, thank you very much for joining us today. It has yeah, been a, so a, a, a true pleasure, really. To finalize, give us three, four take-home messages uh, that you think are really important for, for practitioners out there or cardiologists uh, regarding pulmonary stenosis. Yeah, well, first, uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's really been a, a great discussion, and I appreciate both of your time. As far as take-home messages, for me, um, pulmonary valve stenosis I think is now the predominant congenital heart defect of the dog. And there are some studies to back that up, but I think future studies will show that to be even more the case. We see this disease more and more commonly and whether prevalence is changing or breed um, prevalences are changing uh, is maybe a matter for debate, but this is common. And I think that the practitioner needs to understand that it is common. With respect to treatment, I think the, the take home message is that treatment for this disease is evolving and it is no longer sufficient to simply say he has PS and therefore needs a balloon. To me, we have to do better at understanding what forms of PS the dog has. And that includes multiple ways of assessing the morphology of the valve, as well as the secondary remodeling to the right heart and, and, uh, and the right ventricular function. I think all those things should play a role in how we assess a given patient and decide how to intervene and how we follow that patient over time. And then the last I would say is with those two issues, both prevalence of French bulldogs and other breeds that have more dysplastic forms of PS, and with a better understanding of valve morphology, in my opinion, aided by cardiac CT, we probably need to consider stenting refinement of that procedure and or consider newer therapies that may better address the very thickened fibrotic dysplastic pulmonary valve. Great. Thanks so much, Brian. That was super interesting. And uh, thanks to, uh, to everybody out there for listening. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you, everyone. Don't forget to follow us on socials, uh, our podcast, The Animal Heartbeat. Uh, our handle is at heartbeat underscore pods. See you later. Have a great day.